You, my friend, have never seen anything like this before. Imagine I had a dream and told absolutely no one, but then asked you to tell me what my own dream was and what it means. Well, uh, that's exactly what happened to this man, except that the dreamer wasn't any old commoner like me. He was a high-ranking official of the highest order. The story I'm about to share with you was of great significance at the time, throughout history and even today. Pay close attention to the dates and the symbols we encounter. Do not take my word for it. As the story progresses, be encouraged to double-check the scriptures and history books to confirm or refute this chain of events. And so the story goes. One night around the year 606 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had a dream. This dream was different from any other he had ever had. It stirred the very core of his being. It was so disturbing to him that he could not even sleep. He yearned to grasp its significance, and so in his desperation he summoned his advisors, his magicians, you know, the abracadabra folk, his astrologers, the fellows who read his future under the stars, his sorcerers, which were the witches and warlocks and the Chaldeans to tell him the dream. The Chaldeans were expert officials in these fields. The king's team of wise men could sense the importance of this dream to him. So they told the king to tell them his dream and they would interpret it. The king answered them and loosely, this is what he said in Daniel chapter 2 verse 5. The thing is gone from me. If you do not tell me my own dream and what it means, you will be cut into pieces and your houses will be turned into a garbage heap. The king knew that if he told them the dream, they would give some explanation for it and then only time would tell if it were true or not. He knew the dream had a very important meaning and he was not willing to risk an inaccurate interpretation. As the story in the book of Daniel continues, the king made a decree to kill all his wise men, including Daniel and his companions. Now Daniel was neither a magician, astrologer, sorcerer, Chaldean, nor was he even Babylonian. Daniel was of Jewish nobility and a far way from home. He was a Hebrew captive taken to Babylon during the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem. King Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem and took several hostages, including Daniel, to Babylon. Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who were also captured with him, were chosen to be trained in the language and literature of the Babylonians and they were to serve in the king's court. Despite being in a foreign land, Daniel remained faithful to God and his Jewish beliefs and practices, which eventually led to several remarkable stories and encounters throughout his life in Babylon. Daniel was a trusted and faithful advisor to the king. Back to the royal threat of execution hanging heavy in the air, can you imagine how terrified all the king's advisors must have been in that very moment? They were caught in a predicament unable to meet the king's demand. Daniel went to the king and asked for a little time. He then went to the house of his companions and they prayed that God might show them the dream and its interpretation. They prayed fervently knowing that their lives and the lives of all the wise men in Babylon hung in the balance. The secret was revealed. He had been given the knowledge he needed to interpret the dream. Daniel went to King Nebuchadnezzar and told him that the God of heaven had told him the dream and its interpretation. In chapter 2 verses 31 to 35, Daniel began telling the king exactly what he had seen in the dream. He began to speak. His words must have echoed in the grand hall. King Nebuchadnezzar, he said, in your dream you saw a tremendous, dazzling statue standing tall and mighty. Its head was made of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Then a stone, not cut by human hands, struck the statue's feet, breaking them to pieces. The entire statue crumbled like chaff blown away by the wind, and the stone that struck it became a huge mountain filling the whole earth. Then Daniel moved on to share with Nebuchadnezzar the meaning of the dream in chapter 2, verses 36 to 45. King Nebuchadnezzar, here's the interpretation of your dream. You are the head of gold, representing the kingdom God has given you. After your kingdom, inferior kingdoms will rise, symbolized by silver, then bronze, and finally iron, mixed with clay. These kingdoms will be partly strong and partly brittle, just as you saw with the feet and toes of the statue of iron and clay. Eventually, God will establish an everlasting kingdom that will crush and replace all earthly kingdoms. The stone cut without human hands represents this eternal kingdom, and God has revealed to you the certainty of this future through your dream. This was King Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's divine interpretation of it. The king was taken aback. 
Daniel's interpretation was not only precise, but it also laid out a prophecy of the rise and fall of empires. Take a moment to subscribe and hit the like button as the story doesn't end here. Stay with us as we decode these cryptic messages in the book of Daniel. As written in the scriptures in a little more than 300 words, God sketched out the next 2,500 years of human history in this dream from the time of Babylon to the end of the word's history. Five chapters later, in Daniel 7, God gave Daniel himself a vision at night and showed him the exact same sweep of time from Babylon to the second coming. This time though, God gave to Daniel different symbols for the world's kingdoms than Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream. Instead of a statue with different metal sections, God showed Daniel the same kingdoms, but this time each one was represented by a different animal or beast. Instead of Babylon being represented by the statue's head of gold, Babylon this time was symbolized by a lion with eagle's wings. Rather than the statue's chest and arms of silver was now a bear with three ribs in its mouth. Instead of the belly and thighs of brass was now a four-headed leopard with four wings. Instead of being the legs of iron was now a fearsome beast with iron teeth and ten horns. Now. Up through this point, the two prophecies run completely parallel to each other, but then there's a twist. God gave Daniel much more detail than before. This prophetic panorama moves forward into new territory. Notice Daniel's description of what he saw at this point in his vision of the beasts in chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. So here we have a fearsome ten-horned beast, and a new little horn comes up in the midst of the ten, and the Bible says this new little horn has eyes like the eyes of man, and speaks great things. When the vision was finished, Daniel asked God for an explanation. Can you imagine having seen a vision like that, like any other human being, Daniel must have wondered? What in the world this terrible-looking beast could represent? It was so dreadful looking, so powerful, and it was doing almost unspeakable things. What could this vision mean? Just to read what Daniel saw in his dream would make almost anyone afraid. Daniel knew that whatever it was, it was not good. In Daniel chapters 2 and 7, God has given us a sweeping overview of history from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, more than 600 years before Christ's birth, and continuing to the very end of time at the second coming of Christ. Remember to subscribe as we pick these symbols apart, or depending on how you see it, put them together.